Welcome back to the debrief. We're back after the fourth Alpine stop uh, of the World Cup circuit, wrapping everything is up before the Olympics get started in just a couple weeks to talk about all the action from Briançon and what's coming up next in the Olympics. We have, as always, the author uh, of High Drama, The Rise, Fall and Rebirth of Competition Climbing. That is John Bergman on the right side of your screen. Of course, also covering competition climbing for Climbing Magazine. And our special guest for this week is Natalie Berry, the editor-in-chief of UK climbing uh europe's english language uh you know primo publication for everything climbing but especially her write-ups of the comp circuit are a must read every week and you're going to be heading to the olympics which uh, neither john nor myself unfortunately can say uh so you're going to have a front row well i guess whatever front row counts as in the current condition so first of all thanks for joining us but also tell us about what you're uh, getting to look forward to in the next couple of weeks yeah, I mean, it's all very exciting, but it does depend a lot on your passing tests and all the COVID regulations. Um, I'm due to fly out on the 29th, so in about nine days. But before then, I've got to do two PCR tests, so one 72 hours before and then one 96 hours before. And there's just been so much logistical and organizational stress. I've barely got down to like the storylines and what's actually going to happen at the Olympics. It's just all about trying to get there safely. Yeah, no um, kidding. Hopefully, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to get my second vaccine dose. So I'll be double vaccinated. Um, and just trying to work out what I'll do, because you've got to, as a British citizen, you've got to vac uh, quarantine for three days upon arrival, because cases have been quite high here. Um, so that's just another sort of obstacle to overcome and take into consideration like I've already um changed my flight and extended my trip so it's been quite eventful so far and I've not even got there <laughs> when you do get there which which we all have our fingers crossed that you will um what's the what's the setup that you're expecting to uh to be hooked up in like are you in the big media center and big site or what's the for you know you're not part of a big I'm, I'm guessing you're not going as some big crew of UK climbers I'm guessing it might just be yourself or something so what's the setup that you're going to be working within yeah, it'll just be me. Sadly, we only got one press accreditation. And then despite that, we did plan to have about four people going out to do video stuff outside of the games. Obviously, they couldn't film inside the venue. But now, you know, that's out of the question because people can't travel without an accreditation. Um, so it's just me <laughs> all on my own. Um, and I will have access to the main press center really just as a workspace, I don't have an office or anything there. Um, it looks like it'll be quite a good networking space or just a place to chill out. And it's very close to the Omi Urban Sports Park, which yeah. is where the climbing will take place. As far as coverage goes, it's a bit of an unknown. Like the Olympics is a totally different ball game and you know a totally different monster to the IFSC World Cups. Um, the mixed zone, which is where athletes and the media normally come together to do interviews, has got to be a two meter space between the journalist and the athlete. And I've seen photos of you know, proposed setups and it, it's very, obviously there's a distance between you, you've got masks on, it's going to be quite hard to communicate, especially if you've got a quiet voice like me. <laughs> Um, it'll just generally be a bit awkward, I think. Um, another implication is like I can't record or video or sound in the event, so I'll be taking notes. Um, didn't learn shorthand, <laughs> learn some Japanese, <laughs> so I'll just be scribbling down notes. Um, other considerations if I want to do a video interview outside of the competition, which I'm not too keen on because I don't want to be dragging athletes out of the athlete village and putting them at risk. Um, but if I do do that, say on the last day after the competition, I could, I can't mic them up. I have to use like a stick microphone, stay two meters apart. And it's just all logistically and organizationally quite tricky. So at the moment, um, we're just trying to figure out ways that I could film them efficiently get good sound like I'm not a video journalist but we've got Nick Brown who'll be back in the UK and I'll be sending him some video clips hopefully from me in the hotel me just moving around not from the event obviously but just trying to piece together what it's like to be at 
an Olympics during a pandemic, essentially. But there's, there's so many unknowns. Like, I've never been to an Olympics in normal times before, let right. alone during COVID. So I'm trying to go in with an open mind. Um, I was just saying to John how today there were there's a British journalist who's been told to quarantine for 14 days because he's considered a close contact of someone on a flight. Like he's tested negative about six times in the last week and he's double vaccinated, but because he was sitting quite close to a positive case, he's been told to stay in his hotel room for two weeks. And if that happens to me, I won't be able to cover the games. And it's all <laughs> a huge question mark. Like if that could quite easily happen to me and it's all over from, right. you know, as far as <laughs> covering the event itself, um, I can cover it from the hotel room, <laughs> but yeah, there's, it's a huge risk to take, I think. Um, but it's just seeing how it goes really. I think the the kind of just like behind the scenes, like I, I think people are going to be so desperate for a look of like just what what does the Olympics look like this year? Because I'm sure from from you know our TVs, it's going to look somewhat similar to what it was before. They probably won't pan to the crowd as often, frankly. Um, but you know, otherwise, it's going to look like top athletes doing their thing. But the behind the scenes, all that all that uh, all that like shoulder content is probably going to be pre-recorded stuff from their home countries rather than stuff around the athlete village stuff within the country so yeah I, I hope you get a chance you know even if it's just a terribly shot phone vlog or something like that we i think we'd all love a chance to see how uh, how things look uh from your perspective yeah that's the level i'm going for basically just right. <laughs> film whatever i can and just give a snapshot it's not about production values but right. all of them out the window but just yeah try and get where I can like things like the warm-up area I don't really know if I'll have access to um it's an outdoor event as well and yeah given the heat and the conditions I don't really know what provisions will be in place I've been told we'll be given salt tablets and parasols <laughs> and sun umbrellas um for the media but yeah, it's going to be... They, nobody told you you still have to learn how to acclimatize even when you're done being an athlete. Now, as a media person, you need to go through an acclimatization <laughs> period as well, eh? Well, at least you've got three days to get over the jet lag now. I didn't right. have that before. I was just going straight into the event. So three days to sleep and recover and sort of figure out what I'm doing. At least. John, I think you... it was 90% uh, humidity in Tokyo uh, yesterday or something like that. So that's... Uh, I. You know, I know that the humidity and the heat, I'm sure, have an impact on all sports, but it's really interesting. I have to think that climbing is probably one of the sports where it impact, impacts it the most in the sense that not only is it brutal for the athletes to just stand around in the heat, but also the tactile sense of the friction can really be, be impacted and affected by the humidity, and it, it that just adds a whole other... A layer of intrigue to these Olympics on top of everything that you're intrigue and stress and all that on top of everything else that you're talking about yeah I mean the event starts at about 4 30 in the afternoon Japanese time and I haven't checked yet exactly what <laughs> temperatures will be in sort of mid to late afternoon but I can imagine it's still a lot higher and hotter than it is here in Scotland. It, it makes it so hard to expect like a speed record to be broken in those conditions, like at that time of day. Like I just, I, I, so, I'm a, I really am hoping that the walls are oriented away from the sun. Like if they know what time of day it is, it, man, if the sun's been shining on the walls, that's been a huge error on the part of the organizers. So hopefully they at least have, have that down when we get there. Um, but yeah, it'll be an interesting one. Um, let's talk about Brienne Son. Uh, I can't, I left my phone on the bed, so it's out of reach of me. I can't remember what order we said we were going to do the first, uh, the headlines off of, but I know I'm not first. I think I'm supposed to go third or second. Does anybody remember Natalie who's going was first? first? Natalie's first. All right. So Bri do, you, do you have the results, Tyler? Did oh yeah. 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 This, this is, and I don't want to, I don't, it's stupid trying to talk to our audience. Because, like, whatever, we just do this for fun. But generally, I ignore all suggestions about how this show works. But this one was like, I'll try it once. So whoever asked for the scores to be shown on the screen ahead of time, I'll make you happy at least this one time. So anyway, we'll do a quick recap, and then Natalie will lead us into the headlines. So we'll start. Men climbed first uh, on Sunday. I hope this is big enough for people to see. Uh, Stefano Ghisolfi came out on top, winning his first, or sorry, his fifth 
World Cup lead gold medal uh, in Briançon, followed up by Dmitry Fakurianov from Russia and Martin Stronik from Czechia. Sean Bailey narrowly missed out by basically just a move and a half. Sasha Lehman, uh, Fedir, Alberto, and Luca all uh, rounded out the rest of the final. And for the women, on top was Aliska Adamowska from Czechia again. Uh, second place was maybe the favorite, Natalia Grossman, uh, followed up by Slovenian star hiding in the shadows of Janja Garnbrett, Vita Lukin. Rounding out the rest of the top eight was Ashima Shiraishi, Ryu Nakagawa, write down that pronunciation for everybody uh, keeping track <laughs> at home, uh, and then Luchka Rakovic, uh, Lana Skushik, and Alexandra Takova, uh, another one of the people that thought might have a chance to win gold, unfortunately didn't have the climb of her life. Uh, so that is your, uh, your men's and women's results. End of pandering to the audience. And here we can start the show. So uh, we start with headlines. What was the, the big takeaway headline for uh, from this event, Natalie? Well, I think my headline it's also kind of applicable to Chamonix as well. Um, when the Olympians are away, the underdogs come out to play. Like, not just, you know, people like Stefano or more seasoned athletes who you might expect to be the next wave after the Olympians, but also younger athletes like Ella Adamovska, Alexandra. Like, I know she didn't have the best round um, in Briançon, but just seeing these new faces and some of which were in Chamonix as well, just shows some consistency. And they didn't have the best conditions in Briançon, like downpour of rain. <laughs> um, I think to some extent people expected Briançon to be a bit of a letdown because there weren't as many big names in it. So maybe some people switched off. I think in some respects it was a bit of a shame that Chamonix was like on a Monday and Tuesday, I think some people didn't really expect it to be happening. So when Briançon came along on a weekend, kind of a no more normal IFSC schedule, more people tuned in um, and still put on a great show, the climbers that you might not expect to have been up there in the finals. Um, I think it just bodes really well for Paris 2024. Um, but at the same time, there's a few climbers that, maybe didn't do so well um, compared to or as you would have expected them. Um, yeah, well, other than like, that. You know, we talked about people like Doman Skofic, who when, when all the other field is gone and Doman Skofic is, is in the field, it's really been a drop off for him, his, his last couple of events. Yeah, I think he's had quite a lot to focus on with his climbing gym that he's building. Mm -hmm. And maybe with putting so much more time into that, he's just not, had the energy or resources to train as much and I also wonder if he's helping Yanya to climb you know in her preparation for Tokyo so he's probably just got a lot on his plate but I agree that yeah looking at that list I would have expected Domen and Stefano to be up there I think Domen was up there in qualifications but just couldn't mm -hmm. kind of fit together throughout all the rounds but yeah yeah yeah, no, I, I kind of, that, that thread was one we were keeping an eye on. And that's like, you know, Briançon, Chamedy, I guess, a bit too, but Briançon especially was the event where it was just, you know, dogged by the expectation that it wasn't going to be good because everybody was going to have left town, right? It was going to be a ghost town of a competition. But as it turns out, when you take a bunch of like tier two climbers, they still managed to put on a tier one show. And I was really relieved that it was actually compelling to watch because I was a bit concerned that it might be a bit of a snooze fest, but I was really invested in a lot of these climbers. And I mean, we knew who a lot of them were. And I think that was an interesting aspect of it was, you know, coming in, we were talking about, wow, this is going to shine a spotlight on people that haven't had a spotlight shone on them before. But as it turns out, it was a lot of these old veterans who you might have thought were done and cooked. Martin Stronik and Dmitry Fakirianov, you're like, that's, we honestly, before this season, they would have been absolutely nowhere on my radar for medals for this year. And it was really cool to see climbers like that. And I know she's not a, a, a veteran on the same scale as those two guys, but someone like Ashima Shiraishi, who four years ago won a medal, and we haven't really seen much of her since, uh, you know, seeing her back on the circuit um, was, uh, was great too. So it was a nice mix. Yeah, I think for Martin Stronik to have his second, gold medal in two in the space of a week not even two weeks or is, bronze medal yeah yeah, bronze medal. yeah sorry bronze medal um yeah it was really impressive he's mm -hmm. like a dad to two twins and yeah i think he's just loving it you can tell he's just he didn't expect to be doing so well but i guess 
you know, having fewer competitors in the field is just allowing him to shine. It doesn't mean he's any less of a a great, but he's doing really well for himself and mm-hmm. proving that he's a he's a really capable competitor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you both mentioned the fact that it did seem like this event might have. I don't know how to describe it. Slid under the radar or just kind of gotten overlooked by people or people just kind of shrugged it off because usually after the event, I have a a few friends that watch, you know, this stuff as intensely as you and I do, Tyler, and whatnot, beyond the Discord folks who we all love. And usually after an event, I'll get a few text messages, people texting me about the the events and, and everything. I didn't get any messages this time and I wrote my recap and viewership was a little low on the, you know, compared to what it normally is on these recaps for these World Cup events. So I do think there's some data to support the idea that people just weren't tuned into this as much. Maybe it's because, like we said, there were so many absent big names, Olympians and everything. And that's too bad because it did end up really being a phenomenal, a really exciting event with some great route setting, some some great performances. Yeah, it's too bad. It's kind of... I feel like as we go forward, this one's going to be remembered as kind of like a hidden gem or something like that, right? I don't think this is going to be one that people remember when they look at this season longitudinally a year from now. This is not going to be the event that pops out in everybody's head, but I think if you take the time to to deep dive the results and go back and watch it, I think this will... I think people would be really pleased with this. It was really a, a great showing for a lot of people. I'm curious how the components all come together to have affected the viewership and the coverage, because like, as, as we said off the top, like this was the fourth of four very closely packed together lead world cups that all happened in approximately the same area in the world. And they were just like back to back to back to back. And at some point as viewers, you do get, you know, you don't need to spend every single weekend watching a world cup and especially on nice weekends after like, you know, a, a it's the post COVID summer. And I think people want to be outside, right? There's a lot of people I would normally watch this stuff with who are just saying, no, it's not, I'm not, it's not that they're going to be bad. It's just like, I've got a life to live for the last year that I spent cooped up inside watching, you know, the last five years of world cups on replay just to burn time. So I think there there might just be a little bit of fatigue, but also people really have other stuff to do. Um, and yeah, having Shemini and Brienne on within seven days, I think probably people may not have even expected this World Cup to uh, to happen. So yeah, it might have been a, a mix of all those different things. But if you managed to watch it, it was uh, it was a good time. John, what about you? You got a headline for this one? I do, and <laughs> my headline. I'm trying to think how to phrase it because I don't think it's I don't think it's a headline that either of you probably expected. I, d- I doubt you, either of you have it on your list, but okay. I would phrase it something like this. We might be witnessing the beginning of the end of Japan's depth and dominance. And I, I think that it's important to mention not just their depth and not just their dominance, but having the depth and the dominance together. Tyler, that has been the biggest story for how many seasons now that Japan just seems to keep churning out so many new names and and these names seem to always be making it into finals and whatnot. That was not the case at this event. I think Eddie pointed out that it was not the case at the at last week's event either. And so I started thinking more about it and I was wondering, well, Maybe it's not just this event and last week's event. Maybe it's a, a trend. Maybe it's something that, that we could look at for the full season so far. So here's what I did. And, and then I'll give you both a chance to comment because I'm very curious to get your thoughts on this. Uh, so the Japanese team, the men and the women finalists for all the events so far, okay? So in Meiringen, there were four men and one woman from Team Japan making the finals. For Salt Lake City number one, there was one man and one woman. Salt Lake City two, three men and one woman. Innsbruck, which I just combined bouldering and lead, there were four men and five women. And I should say I'm not including speed World Cups in this because that's not the discipline where we've thought of Japan being so dominant and having depth. So here's where it gets really interesting. At Villars, two men and one woman. Chamonix, zero men and one woman. And Brian Son, zero men and one woman. Now I think those are pretty accurate. I might have missed one or you know, I might have missed one competitor here or there. I put those together pretty quickly. But when you look back at the most recent, the three most recent events, men, zero, 
zero, and two finalists. Women, one, one, and one. That's pretty shocking compared to what where we've been at previous in previous years, right? I'm not saying that's why I said it, maybe it's the beginning of the end. I don't think we're at the point where we can say, okay, from here on out, right, it's it's over. And I'm not to say that we are never going to see Japan Japan do well and send finalists and whatnot. But when you look at that those numbers, that's not a, a country that's overly dominant. That's just right in line with the other countries, right? One finalist here, one finalist there, same as Germany, same as Switzerland or whatever. So I'm going to give the floor to both of you. The, the questions I have, first of all, do you think there's something to this? Yes or no, that we might be seeing a trend. If we are, is it a fact that the other countries like USA, Slovenia, additional countries are catching up? Or is it that Japan is maybe sagging in their results? And I guess the wild card would be, are the Olympics just kind of messing everything up and we can't, we shouldn't be looking at trends this season at all? Yeah, I actually had, <laughs> I, I put them down as my losers, <laughs> not like mm -hmm. not the whole team, but I do think there's something in it, like this event, no, there was only Ryu Nakagawa in the finals and she didn't have the best run and it just felt, I think to anyone watching on the stream, they probably felt like there weren't any Japanese climbers at all because you're so used to seeing so many coming out to climb in semis and finals and just the presence wasn't felt really in the last two events and as you say in the last couple of Boulder World Cups as well I don't really know yeah what is it the start the beginning of the end for them it could be you know I think it's fair to say that Tomoa and Akio really carry the team they're just like figureheads of the team and if they're not there does that affect how the rest of the team climb is there some kind of psychological element is there some kind of structural training like, is there too much focus on the olympians within the japanese national team at the moment that's kind of taking away from the rest of the team i'm not sure um but it definitely without those two kind of on the masthead of the japanese climbing team it, it definitely feels like their presence is lacking a little bit um i don't know whether it's a resources thing or just yeah just not having the best season, it could be that as well. Just in in the case of Akio, that's going to be a permanent thing. Her absence, right? Tomoa will come back after the Olympics, but Akio's gone. So if there are effects from Akio not being there this season, that's something that the the Japanese team has to figure out. They have to evolve and and adapt to that because she's not going to be here. It's interesting because you look at it's almost like the USA and Slovenia have assumed the role that. Previously, we thought of Japan as as having such a, a secure grip on. Like this event, you look at Slovenia, Luka Podokar, Vita Lukin, um, Luchka Rakovic, and Lana um, Skusek. That's you know four finalists between the men and the women there, uh, and on, like we said, only one from Japan. Tyler, I'm curious. I'm gonna I'm gonna put my. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what's Check. wait? What's the what's the motivational quote printed on the paper itself? Uh, that's just a boardman. It's on the back of a bit of note paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm gonna. So, I'm, yeah, I'm, USA check strong. <laughs> that's right. I'm gonna put my foot on the brakes a little bit just because I feel like the COVID plus the Olympic thing is like too much of an overlying theme to like make too many judgments. But I'll see if I can remember all these points in my head. The first one is I don't think Japan in the in the last like handful of years has been as dominant on lead as they are in bouldering like when you think of the current or the most recent crop of japanese stars they are bouldering stars akio has occasionally had some good times in lead kai harada has occasionally had some good times in lead but who is the last japanese like lead superstar i think you'd have to go back to sachiyama which is quite a few years removed at this point um, but on, on top of that, like you guys mentioned, like Kai Harada and Tomoa and Kokoro is not being at these events, Akio not being at these and about to retire, Miho in, you know, her Olympic phase, but also coping with injuries here and there has kind of put a damper on her last handful of seasons. I think that crop, which 
we we need a name for that crop because apparently they they use the term the golden era of Japanese climbers for like Akio and Sakuru Hori like five years too early, which is like a subject of a video for sure. So I think I think most of those superstars we think of are really bouldering stars, and some of them are going to phase out, and some of them are probably just going to stay bouldering. But the the question for me is like I Mori, we haven't seen any of her this year. Why is that? And I have to assume that's an organizational decision. Um, maybe it's just not worth sending somebody that young to a bunch of World Cups. Maybe there's some, you know, other circumstances. I understand Natsuki Tani, she had some other circumstances that stopped her from being on the circuit for a little bit. But we've clearly seen from 2019, at least, some very impressive climbers coming up on the lead side, uh, as well as that trio from uh, Brienson 2020, I think it was, when they swept that lead podium, that European, that unofficial European uh, cup, whatever that was. Um so I'm not I'm not really sure I'm willing to say that, but it could be interesting because you're right. There are a bunch that are about to retire. The stars that aren't about to retire are arguably on the sunset end of their career at this point. And so what will the next crop bring? Will they show up soon? But I don't think I'm willing to judge them until um, until after the Olympics has has subsided. And again, we're looking at a handful of European World Cups on the other side of the Olympics. Uh, or sorry, a handful of Asian World Cups on the other side of the Olympics. So the circuit is moving into their home territory. The Olympics will be over. We're going to have a World Championships. Let's see what happens then. But it has been uh, a season where if you started watching climbing in the last couple events, you wouldn't realize, you're right, that Japan has been one of the dominant teams for the last couple of years. So yeah, interesting it's, it's point. Just, yeah, and it's interesting to see, you know, Slovenia and the United States are in similar situations in that they have Olympians that are focusing on the Olympics and sort of removed from these most recent competitions. And yet the U S and Slovenia in particular continue to do well at these competitions and send multiple people to the finals. That is what we would have thought Japan, that, that would have been kind of their bread and butter. If you had asked us a, a year ago or two years ago, okay, when Japan removes their Olympians, when a team removes their Olympians and still has to put people into the finals at these World Cups, who do you think it will be? We we would have said, oh, Japan definitely will do that. Now, to your point, Tyler, I want to be completely respectful of, obviously, Slovenia and the United States and Japan are, you know, all dealing with COVID and presumably all have unique challenges related to that and and their own you know their own countries and stuff mm -hmm. so that might be a and it does seem like those teams all have very different attitudes like team usa has not shown any interest in curbing what events they send their team to like they have sent their top athletes to every single event japan has definitely been way more cautious and whether that's a covid decision or a training decision i have no idea but we've seen way fewer japanese stars this season than we have americans or slovenians so there's there's certainly some institutional disagreement on how to run a team during the season and it's uh it's yeah it's it's resulting in fewer japanese climbers here so i think we'll have to judge a little bit later on but yeah I was surprised that Futaba Ito wasn't competing as much because she's kind of the bridge. I see her as the bridge between the Kyo Tomoe generation and the yeah, next I'm, generation. I'm, I forgot about her, yeah. Yeah, totally. Tokyo Nation, but yeah, she's not being present either. So. Yeah. So my headline for this is Checkmate because I need to start with a pun all the time. So Czech spelled C-Z-E-C-H, obviously. Upcomer Adamovska and veteran Stronach earned Czechia's first double medal. Um, this was a little bit of a surprise to me. So so this weekend, um, Eliska, once you saw the roster, you would have to say she was up there as one of the medal favorites. She ended up with a gold, which is incredible after seeing her become a, a an Olympic contender in that European Championships uh, last year in Moscow. But then Martin Stronach, again, at the start of the season, nobody would have pegged him for, for medals, especially in, in lead in particular, would not have been uh, uh, really uh, something you would consider. But interestingly, to have them both win uh, at the same event means this is the first time that uh, Czechia has won two medals at the same event. And it's surprising because there have been a couple eras where superstar Czech athletes have competed at the same time. So the ones that the one I remember specifically was uh, Tomo Mrazic and Adamandra overlapped a bit in like the late aughts, early 2010s or whatever we call that weird era that we lived through. Um, and then also Martin Stronach was in there as well. Him and Andra overlapped with bouldering uh, and him and Tomo as well, but they never uh, meddled at the same time. 
Um, in speed, Libor Rosa and Jan Kriz never uh, never overlapped. And then I also found a, a female Czech boulderer from from kind of back in the day, Vera Kotasova. She never overlapped with uh, Tomas Mrazic. So while they've had a bunch of stars over different eras, they've never earned that double medal. And I think it's fascinating that they achieved that goal with Adam Andra just completely, you know, absent. So they had this like excellent comp for their national program with a combination of a storied veteran who their superstar looks up to and sings the praises of all the time, and this new upcomer who had a very emotional competition and really was like the highlight of the event, was seeing how much this win meant to her. So I thought that was the headline. Uh, it was a big, uh, you can check that off as a win uh, on my side. And you can all groan. <laughs> right, headline. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I thought Ella was so impressive. You could tell as soon as she stepped on the wall, like it was quite a uncomfortable start. Like mm -hmm. if you live like more confident, gutsy climbing style girls, they found it quite unsettling, I think. And she just got straight up there, looked really composed on the kind of middle of the overhang, just rested, looked at what she had to do and just fought for it. She wasn't giving up. She looked like she'd been in multiple finals and this is her first final and she won like not only did she get on the podium she won but she just looked so at home and I can tell like, I've seen some of her Instagram posts since and she's she can't believe it I don't think anyone would have pegged her for the win as you say but she's clearly got potential and a really strong mindset to just get out there and perform so well on her first final at senior level mm -hmm. barring the European Championships yeah. but not a lot to add, but suddenly the Czech Republic has a nice little squad, right? A nice little trio <laughs> with Alishka and Martin in these event in these competitions, and then of course Andra's not there. But when it when when you think of Czech Republic competition climbing, like of course he's you think of Andra first and foremost, and so between Andra and Martin and Alishka, they have yeah, a good little squad for 2020, 2021, right? Like they the um. Been, it's been cool. There's there's one note that I forgot to mention just because I, I especially with the women, I think I always forget how few active gold medal winners there are in women when it's bouldering and lead. Like the club of people on the circuit who have won gold medals is crazy. So just to, to make sure people are aware, here are the five people. There's only five in the women's lead circuit who have ever won a gold medal before. And that is Yanya Garnbret, Jesse Pills, Cheyenne So, Laura Regora, and now Eliska Adamowska. Right? That's it. There's only five of them. So it Absolutely. like compared to men, which is probably twice as many, if not more, that are currently active in the circuit, it is such a small club to become a part of, whether it's bouldering or lead. And I think that's just like she she had a great chance to take it. She got it. And now she's part of that like very small club. So cool. A little bit of trivia. Um, uh, uh, the the implicate the the subtext there is Yanya's dominance, of course, well, right? Yeah, it's, it's to, like, won I mean, so many medals over the past couple seasons. Yeah, also, you know, uh, uh, Jane Kim also, you know, relatively yeah. recently retiring, so, and Annick Verhoeven as well, right? Like, if we if we made that stat, like, just a year ago, it would have been a little bit different, but yeah, since some people have kind of bailed, uh, it's changed things. Um, but anyway, uh, we're going to the winners, and we, we didn't end up really talking about this, but my winner for the event is Stefano Gisolfi. Um, he has been having a pretty good season so far, but this event he qualified, I think, in second place behind like a really well-performing Luca Porochar. Um, in semifinals, I think he tied, but was still placed first. Uh, he tied with Sean Bailey, um, who's been also another dominant force in the season. And then when we get to the final route, which you know maybe not visually impressive, but at least it had had you know an interesting variety of moves, an interesting style. It looked like it required a lot of thought and strategy, particularly through how you're going to manage yourself through the roof section. Um, he Sean, where a lot of the other climbers were doubting themselves or, or wasting energy in ways that didn't make sense. And of course, to top it off, having that you know near fall right towards the end where he just falls into a one arm lock off with his left hand just palming the rest of the volume and then going on to achieve a clear high point as the last climber of the comp was awesome. And off the tail of that, it sets him up right now as the as currently leading the race for the uh, for the season ranking. Um, and depending how the rest of the season goes, he's in a great spot to get a medal, but possibly be the guy that wins the season. 
Um, I think he came second in the season in 2017 and 2018. And of course he's been like, he, he's been on podium since like 2012. So he's been around forever, but it seems like his seasons get better and better and better. You know, he's like 28. So he's really maturing into his, uh, into his medal season, but great event for him. Awesome end to the, uh, to the round. And the French crowd seemed to really embrace him as the winner, even though it was like pissing rain at the time that he came off the wall, everybody in a tent umbrella coats up, but they were loud for him. And it was a great, uh, a great finisher for the men's side yeah i think after the disappointment of not qualifying for tokyo 2020 is really nice for him to be up there again showing that he's such a strong lead specialist you know i wasn't ever sure that he would qualify for tokyo but it's just really nice to see him doing so well and especially when he got the news mid lockdown i think that must have been such a blow for him mm -hmm. yeah yeah, cool little. It's it's interesting to look at Stefano and and the parallels to Sean Bailey, uh, both in them both being veterans on the circuit, both of them shining this season in particular, both of them under different circumstances though, both of them, you know, um, have being Olympic hopefuls from their for their respective countries and then managing to come back from that. I think better than any of us could imagine just like rocking and rolling this season. I, I think Stefan and, and they're both very likable They in the, you know, they both have their own fan bases and whatnot. So it's, uh, it's really cool to have Stefano and Sean Bailey really shining this season. I know this Sean, you know, this wasn't, um, he didn't get the podium this, this competition, but I, it's interesting looking at them. I do see a lot of, Oh, and also aren't they, they both have, I know we don't really talk about outdoor sins, uh, that much but i think they both kind of share that proclivity as well to to do the comp circuit and then also kind of split their mind and do outdoor projects as well they, they seem kind of like kindred spirits in some ways you mentioned them both being veterans and that broke my head for a second but yeah they're both they're only three years apart like stefano is the same age as adam andre so he's born in 93 and sean bailey if i remember right is born 96 because he's 25 this year so yeah they're like i i think I think Sean gets lumped into that like new crew of young Americans who are all born in like 2001. But yeah, you're right. Sean is, you know, much older than them, even though he's, he looks like uh, that podium from, from Chamonix where it looked like it was just Sean Bailey, the kid standing with like his two dads, <laughs> like Martin Stronach and Stefano Gisolfi just like towering over him all bearded up. But yeah, no, he definitely qualifies as a, as a veteran in climbing, if not on the podium, but yeah. Yeah. Interesting point. Um, Natalie, I guess, Natalie, who's, uh, who's your big winner? I think my big winner was Vita Lucan of Slovenia because mm. I couldn't believe this. I didn't realize at the time, but this is her first senior World Cup podium, which just seems crazy because I've seen so much of her. She's so consistent. She's made finals, I don't know how many times, but you know, I pegged her as you know a multiple podiumist, but she's never been on it before and just. For the first time ever, I think she'd made four finals in Briançon, but she'd never been on the podium. And finally, she just <laughs> broke through and got a bronze medal. And I think she could have done even better than bronze, to be honest. She looked quite comfortable. But yeah, for her, that's a huge achievement. And I think that might just give her the confidence boost to keep making podiums. And especially in, you can talk about Yanni's absence, but I think... She, she climbed really well and she totally deserves to have a podium place. And she's just so consistent. And I think a lot of people like me probably wouldn't have thought that she'd never been on the podium. I didn't realize that until you until you said it. That's a really interesting po a statistic that she had never done that before. I yeah, had to check I, as well. I, in my head, I think of her as like a fairly top tier, you know, climber, but yeah. That says yeah. a lot though. Yeah. That says a lot of performances. It says a lot about how fun she is to watch climb then because she certainly seems in our mind like somebody we've seen on the podium before. So we, undoubtedly we've just enjoyed watching her performances before to the point where we thought we just thought she'd done incredibly well. So good, good pick. Good for her. She climbs like a pro. And I think that's the, that's the interesting thing about that 
crowd that gets to climb on that Slovenian team is like every single one of them looks like a professional and pretty much all of them look like they deserve to be in finals. We have this like running joke that there's always a Slovenian that has an embarrassing low fall in finals, which pretty much always comes true, but it's made easier because there's like six of them in every finals nowadays. Um, but she, she looks like she takes it seriously. She puts full effort in on the wall. She's got the build and the attitude that makes it look like she believes that she's a contender. And you're right now that now that it's actually come true i hope that that's something that you know hopefully she's tasted that and she just wants more of it and maybe uh gives her the motivation to say like you know i can earn just as many medals as yanya let me uh, kick it into the next gear i think that would be sick like how wouldn't it be great to have like an inter inter country rivalry where you've got like two of the best climbers in the world that just from one country not like that's pretty far away but if that did happen that would be sick yeah this kind of yeah please yeah i think she's also had a few injury setbacks, which maybe means we've not seen her at her full potential. So even while she's making top tens or semis or finals quite regularly, she's probably been blighted by injury. And again, if she couldn't compete in Moscow because she failed a COVID test, even though it was a week or two before she couldn't pass that. So we've, we've definitely been, she's been deprived of a couple of opportunities where she could have won big, I think. Right. It's interesting that this kind of circles back to the conversation we were having about Team Japan in the sense that you look at the two countries that are really shining this season in the women's division, the United States and Slovenia, in terms of just consistency. They both have uh, this, I don't know, leader, pinnacle competitor in, in Janja Garnbrett for Slovenia and I would say Natalia Grossman for the, for the United States. Japan doesn't really have that, and they're certainly not going to have it once Akio retires. Um, so that just, it's interesting how some some connective tissue can be made to that previous discussion that we were having in terms of the big what if or, or what happens to Japan, you know, from this season and, and going forward. Because I, I do think that the success of, of Vita and other Slovenian women and the whole Slovenian team, I think that there is a trickle down effect from Yanya's success. I think that that it's hard to measure, but I do think that that's a, a really important thing. I think it matters to have that, that big marquee name captain of the team or whatever you want to call it, officially or unofficially. I think that goes a long way in motivating other people on the team to, to rise up, to rise to their, try and rise to that great level. Vita seems to be doing that, you know, getting better and better, right? Trying to, rise to Yanya's level as as difficult as that is of course other members of team usa trying to do that i would think to rise to natalia's level who are they rising to on team japan you know it's like well i don't know especially if akio has gone it's tricky big shoes to fill yeah and the generational yeah. gap is so wide too that's an is is it is really like a 10-year gap between the one like akio and the ones that are coming up you i guess you kind of have to skip miho if you want to I guess agree with me, but but yeah, it does feel like it is a, a, a pretty wide generational gap. Um, but yeah, interesting. John, what about you? Who's your big winner? Yeah, this is dovetails to what I was just saying. I have to put Natalia on the on my winners column again for a few reasons. First of all, I don't know if people outside of the United States realize how incredible it is to see her doing so consistently well on this lead season because she was thought to be and performatively really was primarily a boulderer back when she was crushing on the national circuit, even just in 2018, 2019, it, it, similar to how we think of somebody like Tomoa as a, as a boulder, right? We thought of Natalia that way. Um, so to see her do this great in so many lead competitions is just really, really impressive. I think somebody in the discord joked and it was a good joke, although there's kind of some truth to it that she's going to need to buy another suitcase to, to fill it with all the, prizes and swag and medals that she's collected on she needs a really good tax portion. lawyer man she's dragging a ton of cash back to the united states <laughs> yes and most importantly it's really interesting to to kind of assess how i'm thinking or how i'm feeling when she approaches a climb when she walks up to the lead wall now and and a bouldering wall as well i would i would assume but when she walked up at at Briançon to the lead wall, I have this feeling of, I don't know if it's 
like confidence in in her her capability or her potential or just it's kind of like this oh she's got this right and that's not to say she she necessarily will win or anything like that but to relay it to other people it's the same kind of feeling you have when Yanya walks up to a lead wall, it's the same type of feeling we had when Jian Kim approached a lead wall, or it's the same type of feeling, Tyler, we had when Cheon So would walk up to the lead wall in 2019, right? Just this feeling of, like, just confidence that she's going to do, she's, unless something goes horribly wrong, which could happen, a foot could slip or whatever, like, she's going to do very well. And that is really exciting because, I was not, of course, covering the scene when Robin Herbisfield was on the was was in her big run in the '90s. So we've I've never really felt that way about a, a a woman, an American woman on in the lead division. We've never really had that kind of not, to take nothing away from all the the women that have competed in the division and stuff, but just there's something about Natalia and the confidence you have in her performance every time she approaches the wall this season. Um, it's just it's it's really special. It's really cool to see. I think it definitely comes across not just US viewers as well she just looks so composed and she's smiling all the time and there's a lot of chatter on Instagram social media right now saying like my face doesn't look like that when I'm climbing how is she so relaxed how is she so happy but I think she's genuinely just so excited and psyched to be on the wall competing and obviously a results in you know Salt Lake City are really catalyze that confidence and she, she believes that she can make podiums now she's done it in every competition she's entered pretty much so far and I think she's just she's on a roll and yeah I don't know where she's going to start but she could end with you know season titles in both disciplines we don't know but again I think talking about rivalries and you know training partnerships the fact that she can climb with Brooke an Olympian and you know who also looks on fabulous form at the moment they're pushing each other and you can tell it's paying off both of them just supporting each other is, I think that's really important because a lot of the time with women from the same country it can get quite competitive and unfriendly and I guess with guys as well but I, from experience like I can I can tell that sometimes with female competitors, it doesn't always work out the same way. It's not as pally and friendly. Um, but those two girls, you can tell that they've got genuine you know, respect and love for each other. And it's just helping each other's performance so much at the moment. And I can't wait to see where they take it. I feel like you must have a, a gossip book ready to write on the women on the on the, 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 the G, on the GB women's team. <laughs> um, okay, so interesting point is I don't as a World Cup like I'm not I'm I've never really watched Natalia in youth comps. Well, I, I probably saw her like in 2013 or 2014 briefly, but um, as a World Cup viewer, I don't know what it looks like for Natalia to fail. Like when I like I think of the the best the best climbers on the circuit right now, Adam Andra, uh, Yanni Garnbrett, they're the ultimate stars. Everybody would bet on them in most situations, but we all know exactly what it looks like when they fail, particularly Adam Andra, because one of his signatures is screaming, being angry, being frustrated, slapping the wall, kicking the wall, kicking a chalk bag. In my head, I have a mental image of what that possibility is. If my brain tries to conjure what it means for Natalia Grossman to fail, I can't because I all I see is her smiling constantly and getting to the top of problems. Like I literally don't have a reference point in my head to imagine what her failing looks like, which might be, you know, a, a symptom of the fact that she hasn't been on the circuit enough for us to see that, which is probably the case. We'll probably see her fail eventually. But at the moment, everything that I associate with Natalia Grossman is never ending confidence and never ending positive vibes and always getting a result that she's happy with. So I can't, like, you know, as much as her failing is as much a possibility for her as anyone else, even though she hasn't been on the circuit that long, you're right, John, she does fit into that Jane Kim, Yanya Garnbrett era or um, uh, echelon of of they only win. Right. Like there's very few memories of, of seeing some of those people uh, fall a lot. So you are confident when they get on the wall because you have no reference otherwise, which is really fascinating that you bring it up. Um, and, and you know who else is in that category of somebody we don't really know what it looks like when they fail is Che Eun So. Sure. Right. Yep. Because she had that phenomenal 2019, and then pandemic happened. Asia Continentals got canceled, and and she qualified from the Olympics kind of on a, the you know the technicality right. of the 
the Hachioji or whatever. Uh, so it's it'll be really interesting now. Let's get Cheon on the lead circuit when Natalia's also on the lead circuit and Yanya's on the lead circuit. Gosh, that's pretty that's pretty exciting stuff. And just for people keeping track, like Natalia has now earned a medal in every single World Cup this season, whether it's in Boulder or lead. Team USA has 15 medals. Seven of them are Natalia's. The next closest contributor is Sean Bailey with three, what, Brooke with two, and then Emma Hunt has one, Colin has one, and Nathaniel has, has Nathaniel medaled? I can't even remember. Who The guy who I would have pegged as like the superstar of the U.S. team at the start of the season, I can't even remember if he's medaled or not because Natalia has just banged them all out. Wild. She, we she talked might, about, okay, Team USA having their best season ever. She might be about to break the record for the best American athlete season ever individually. We'll have to go back and count the medals for that one, but that's certainly possible. She, she's a fascinating case, too, because she she's not a rookie, right? Like, she's uh, 20 years old, I think, right? Brooke's age, same age as Brooke. Uh, so, and she's done World Cups before, but I don't think anybody in watching her previous performances would have ever guessed that this would happen this season, this remarkable season. I mean, it's, it, it, it's just fascinating because we've seen the phenom kind of like Yanya, right. Who is good. And then she stays good and, and gets better and better. But Natalia's this interesting case where she really seems to be sudden, not just peaking, but going from like Z to a right. Uh, in, in one season, not Z, that's not fair to her previous career her previous results but you know what i mean like a really remarkable jump in her in her results i saw in i think it was in myringen or maybe salt lake in a post climb interview with the ifsc she said i've been working so much on my mindset i think that's what's made the difference and you can tell maybe it's got something to do with positivity and smiling and just having a good time because well whatever it is it seems to be working <laughs> And I'm sure you know she moved to was it the Salt Lake City training camp? Um, I don't sure. I don't know if she's officially moved there yet, but I believe she's been spending a lot of time there. So yeah, so just physically and mentally, she seems to have upped her game. I guess we didn't really get to see her in 2019 in Vail. I think she just missed out in finals in the Boulder World Cup. I think she was seventh, and that was maybe a sort of a little hint at what was to come but sadly we didn't get to see her in 2020 so yeah I guess it's not like Z to A but yeah she had she was kind of on the rise but we didn't get the opportunity to see what she was actually capable of until now and she's just risen straight to the top mm -hmm. yeah let's reverse it let's go A to Z and talk about our losers from the competition uh Natalie went first on that and then I went so John's going first what's uh who who dropped the ball Tyler I'm apologizing because I know he's one of your favorites <laughs> and I like him too I think Natalie likes him as well wa likes watching him I'm just gonna turn to the flag as you uh, as you go through this so <laughs> I've got to put Alberto Hines. Oh, Lopez. I thought you were going to go with Victor. Okay, damn it. You stole oh, mine. No, go no, for it. Go no, for it. <laughs> I, I put Alberto on there. And I, when I wrote, when I wrote the recap, I kind of did a little outline beforehand of some things I expected or things that I hoped. And I really hoped I do instead of winners and losers, I do a thing called highs and lows. And I really wanted to put Alberto in the highs category because I think it's really admirable that he is did the full circuit up until the Olympics, right? He was the only competitor that did that. And um, and I think that that was really cool to watch. I think it was great for fans, for, for Olympic intrigue, all that stuff. I kind of wonder if it sort of backfired in his face a little bit because I think he's, he's a young competitor. Presumably, he was doing that to gain experience maybe gain some confidence right but what ends up happening i can't speak for him i don't know but i don't he's he hasn't gotten the results that we expected i wonder if he got seventh place here i wonder if it ends up kind of denting his confidence a little heading into the olympics because keep in mind this is his specialty discipline in lead climbing that's what he is supposed to be best at it is a severely diminished field, not to say there aren't crushers still, obviously, Sean Bailey, Stefano, et cetera. But, you know, there are a lot of 
like he's one of those people like we always talk about. When the Olympians are gone, that gives an opportunity for for others to shine. Well, this is his specialty discipline. He's a qualified Olympian. He should be shining. And he and he, you know, I mean, he made finals, so I don't want to act like it was a total disaster. But uh, but, you know, seventh place, that's not the same confidence boost that a gold or a silver or even a fourth or fifth place would be heading into Tokyo. Additionally, I think it was um, Sebastian Halinki on the commentary said that he noticed Alberto has looked really tired. I think that was his words. He said he looked really tired recently at the at the most recent World Cups. We'll have to take Sebastian's word for it. I don't know. We haven't really seen close ups or interviews with with Alberto. But if that's the case, tired, meaning he's just exhausted from trying to train for the Olympics and do the full World Cup circuit, that just adds to it of this idea of of. Yeah, it was maybe a good day, a good idea on paper, but in practice, when you try to do all this, I, I just, I, do, I don't think it worked out to, as he was hoping. Now we all, like I said, we all three here like him, so I, we, I mean, we would, nothing would be greater than if he would end up shining in, in Tokyo and using all of this season so far as a motivator, but remains to be seen. Yeah, I just. As you said, I think I agreed with the commentary that he looked really tired, that maybe it was just one event too far, like considering no other Olympians were competing, like maybe that was for good reason in the end. And I know he's a young competitor and he's wanting to get more experience, but I just felt that like doing you know, European youth events, so like alongside World Cups, he's been doing junior events and, and winning, I think, doing quite well. But just the culmination of it. It's not just training and competing, it's the travel and also as someone who's preparing to, you know, have PCR tests for travel, like I would be quite anxious about you know, being at a big event with lots of people with just a week to go or he must be, you know, less than a week until he travels out. So I was quite surprised to see him on the start list. I actually thought it might be a mistake and maybe he'd just gone off to Tokyo, but yeah, bold, and, and I can see why he would want to do it, so just so it feels like another weekend, another competition in Tokyo. But, yeah, if it dents his confidence, I don't think it was ultimately the best decision. But, yeah, hopefully he can rest a little bit before Tokyo and give it his all there. I'm, I'm on the same page as you guys. You know, he's he's the kind of personality that I want to have succeed because he is compelling. And on his best days, he is colorful and expressive. And I want him to be the kind of person that's a star in the sport. And just following up where you guys are. Yeah, he's, he's competed at 11 separate World Cups and Euro Youth Cups or World Champs or, or uh, European Continental Championships. Um, and some of those he did multiple disciplines. So in total, since Meringen, uh, or maybe one before Meringen, He's competed in 16 separate medal events this year, right? Like 16 and that's speed, that's boulder, that's lead, all of that stuff. He's been doing a ton of climbing. And so in my head, the only way I can justify it is if they decided that his weakness is performance and they needed him to get a ton of experience in, learn what it feels like to lose, to win, what's the difference, get your flow together. But it's come at the expense of him at the moment looking worse and worse as every event goes on so if he manages to find a couple days to rest in between the tests the flight being locked in an athlete's village that is way out of your comfort zone being stuck in a climate that is probably well i don't know what what his normal living conditions in spain are maybe they're somewhat comparable to to tokyo in the summer but with all the stuff he's about to go through in the next couple of weeks leading up to the most stressful competition of his life i'm skeptical that he manages to somehow get it all together to perform in Tokyo, which is a bit disappointing. I'll leave it open. Maybe he's that kind of guy that can pull it together. Maybe he just needs a couple of weeks off. Um, but I, I am a little bit concerned that he's put himself into a corner where he's not going to be anywhere close to his best uh, when it's showtime. Uh, so yeah, I, I also put him as, uh, as my, as my biggest loser when I was putting everything together. Um, who go? I guess I go next. Uh, so if I can't do Alberto, it wasn't really that huge a loser, but I'll, I'll bring it up. And it's just really as a conversation starter. While the root setting was very functional, I thought it was also largely forgettable. Um, semifinals already out of my mind. And finals, while the men's route, we got to see some interesting new holds that looked compelling on their own. 
you know, we've talked in the past about how there is a visual component to route setting and how it's nice to be able to track climbers' progress by providing visual checkpoints as to where they are in the climb and try and have some unity between the visual cues of the route and how that connects with the physical experience that the climber is uh, is going through. And I felt it largely lacked that. I think the 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 most notable parts of the climbs were the roof sections, which is where we saw a lot of people struggling or falling. And so we spent a lot of camera time on those areas. In men's, it was that kind of roof traverse through the pipes. And for the women, it was where things got risky, going to that dead point, to that really rough crimp. Um, I, again, I thought the function was great. I thought the separation was awesome. I thought the places where people were falling were were you know, fair and also exciting to see whether or not they would stick these moves and how they would approach different sequences. But the roots are very quickly shedding from my mind and becoming just, you know, like fragments from the past that I won't be able to remember in the future. And after Innsbruck and Villars, in my opinion, were very impressive. These two French World Cups in uh, Chamonix and Briançon kind of went the other way, went very French. And if French means functional then that's awesome but again forgettable uh which i thought was a bit disappointing fortunately the climbers made up for it but i thought it's 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 definitely the most boring looking wall on the circuit just a big gray beast everything's just full it's just fully cheesed screw holes everywhere it's looking a little bit dated there's not much variety in the color and then it's just purple blobs all the way up the wall white blobs all the way up the wall and uh yeah it is it has filtered from my mind yeah, I agree. I thought when I saw the women's route and even Molly on the comments said, oh, it looks pretty basic. And I looked at it and I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. it just looks like... It looks like a gym route, like, you know. Yeah, it looked a bit... I actually thought it looked too easy. Thankfully, it turned out to be a bit more complex than that. But mm. yeah, just they didn't use... It was interesting to see there weren't many like big PU blobby volumes or like any jumps. It was all like quite crimpy old school um setting and those old yellow volumes that the rope kept being stuck under <laughs> was a bit frustrating i think that was my main gripe with root setting just it must have been quite obvious when testing like to you know that the rope was going to get caught around that edge or on your feet and it was just quite sad there were definitely a few climbers like i think Eva Maria Hammermuller and a few others who definitely got a bit balked by that and if that hadn't have happened they might have climbed a bit higher I mean it is something that as an athlete you have to try and take into account you have to be prepared for something like a minor technical issue to happen but at the same time it does take away from the climbing a bit uh, yes I agree with everything you said Tyler I, I don't think there were any men's tops the whole weekend if I if I remember correctly from the results and from semifinals um not that there has to be but it's of course it's always nice if you get at least one top for round I, th I think that's kind of the nice uh, You're right yeah. visual no yeah no tops or and, I should double check qualifiers I guess but no yeah nothing yeah um I think that that just kind of circles back to what we were saying at the onset of this the beginning of this episode which is that like it was a great comp but there wasn't anything particularly memorable about it right away like nobody was messaging me pictures of moves or, or you know none of the moves became viral clips or anything no nothing too flashy and granted that's a yeah you know, it's a fine line you don't want flash for the sake of flash necessarily but uh, yeah I just um i like the the kando was it the kando tubes was that the um the company that makes those i thought those were cool but uh a little monotonous all the way up yeah it was, uh, they were well represented is a polite way of saying how many of them there were on the wall. But yeah, um, it's, we've talked in the past about the idea of like iconic climbing walls. Like what are the, what are the, not just the location, but the wall itself that really stands out and becomes kind of a, an integral part in the identity of, uh, of a stop. And I think uh, we, we, we discussed like, what were the oldest walls? What were the grungiest walls? And I think the Cron wall being indoors, being modular, being like all grooved and featured and stuff was kind of like the, the clear winner for the most dated relic of a, of a competition venue. But if, if, if I remember right, the reason the World Cups were moved to Lublin or whatever, however you pronounce that, was because they were renovating that wall and making it new again. So if the comp has now moved to the new Cronwall, 
Brienne Son has to be in the running for the most dreary looking competition wall on the circuit at the moment. So congratulations, France. That's... It wasn't helped by the weather either, <laughs> it was, right? It was just like, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's an old looking wall. It was gray, dingy looking weather. Yeah. Um, to anybody tuning in that's maybe a more casual fan, there's no there's no Yanya, there's no Andra, right? Like there were all these factors that I think were adding to it. Sure. Just, just kind of coming away seeming like, yeah, it was all right. Yeah. It was okay. Yeah. But. Yeah, totally. I now think that so on, they tend to have a, they have a bit of a tendency to set like, a stop a move just on the edge of the roof and people either fall off there or then get quite far at the top and it's just a quite an odd selection of angles like slightly steep massive overhang and then a head wall it's just very it's a bit boring and old school i think the yeah. volume yeah, old school the... is a really good description for it it yeah. does it does seem like it, 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 it Five years ago, ten years ago, it might not have seemed old school, but now in through a 2021 lens and, and the type of moves we're used to, the type of walls that we're used to, yeah, it just seems like a little bit of a relic. Mm -hmm. Which I'm okay with being represented on the circuit, but it was just, you know, something to something to talk about. Anyway, uh, Natalie, for yourself, for your uh, your loser for this weekend. Yeah, I mean, I hate to call her a loser, maybe just... Too bad. You know what you're getting into. <laughs> Alexandra Tokova, Bulgaria, in her amazing green suit. I love it. It's amazing. Um, you know, third place, first podium last weekend in Chamonix. Looked really promising for this weekend. And then in the final, I think she just rushed the first section of the route a little bit. Maybe underestimated it, as I did. You know, looked at it, thought maybe this looks a bit basic. But just a few moves where you had to move a bit more slowly and she's got a very punchy gutsy style and I just don't think it it suited her and she just misread it and although I got to see that double dino did you see that mm -hmm. what the move she did into the room and she caught it but she does take risks and a lot of the time they seem to pay off it's a bit like Yanya Garnbrett she doesn't hold back she just throws herself into moves with confidence but I think for Alexandra, maybe this week, it was an example of a route where she performed well on a couple of moves, but maybe misjudged what she needed to do on, on some of them and just needed to change pace a bit. And it's possibly just an experience thing. The more final she does, the more of those kind of changes in pace she'll get used to and hopefully be on the podium again. Cause She's so good to watch. She's kind of like mm. Vita or Yanya. Sometimes she looks like she's falling off or she's really pumped and then she's absolutely fine. She's just chilling out and ready for the next move. So I think she's got a really bright future ahead of her. I just thought this weekend she maybe didn't achieve quite as much as she was capable of. She, she reminds me of, of Alberto when he's on his peak energy because he takes a lot of risks that a lot of people would probably say are unnecessary sometimes but it defines his style and it makes it exciting and a lot of the times it works and every once in a while it doesn't um and it was too bad because she was in that crew of yeah of metal potentials for this so week and something i regret we didn't talk about last week and it's because i didn't it just didn't cross my mind but when i looked back at it yeah last uh, last week when she won that bronze that was the first world cup medal for a bulgarian athlete in climbing oh nice ever as far as i cool. can tell um, so I, I regret that we didn't get it, get it on that day, but that's a huge deal considering like Bulgaria has hosted a bunch of world cups, particularly like if you go back, but also being the home of Waltopia, which is, you know, the world's largest wall builder, I would guess, like maybe there's something in Asia that just I'm not as aware of, but Waltopia is just so dominant in North America and Europe, at least in terms of being a part of like the fabric of indoor and competition climbing that it's nice to see that there's an athlete coming from that that country that maybe you can combine those two those two aspects together and try and hopefully make a really profitable and successful arrangement for for both of them because because uh, i think she is compelling to watch and um yeah and also yeah props to whoever designed the bulgarian team uniform which i kind of made the joke like it must be just like the leftover wrestling uniform from the bulgarian wrestling <laughs> team or something because how often do we see a full body you know like ankle to ankle to neck uniform and climbing but it's sick and it's like an instant identity and people are just spamming green emojis like in the chat when she gets on the wall it's awesome 
but yeah. It, it, it looks to me like a speed uniform a little bit, so I was wondering if maybe the team, the Bulgarian the Federation or whatever, chose the uniform thinking, okay, this could be worn for speed climbing and you could just wear it for, for lead climbing, bouldering. I don't know. That It's just when yeah, I look maybe. at it, I, I was like, it looks like the speed you know, unitards or whatever that you know that we've seen this season and other seasons. It's it's really fascinating that Natalie, you said her style com- reminds you of Yanya a little bit, and Tyler, you said Alberto. We all three have somebody different that her <laughs> that her style reminds her. Of. I when I watched her, particularly in this round, I thought of Tamoa because particularly in that Tamoa's. Another risky Criticism. guy where it doesn't always pay off. <laughs> yeah, I mean the big the big knock on on Tomoa has been that he has this incredibly fun style to watch, kind of reckless abandon, just going always going like 110 percent at every move. And the criticism has been, as great as he has been, there's been some times when you say, oh, I wish he, you know, I, I wish he'd slow down a bit. I wish he would be a little more cerebral in his in his kind of methodology on the wall every now and then. And that kind of seemed to be the case here with with Alexandra as well. It's just like you said, Natalie, it looked like she should maybe should have slowed down a little bit, maybe should have thought a little bit uh, rather than just kind of continuing this um, sort of so so jumpy. I was debating whether or not to put her in the loser category. I I ultimately didn't because I she was right on the bubble. I think if she would have not made finals, I probably would have said, yeah, that was a kind of a big drop. But she was, she got, she managed to get into the finals, got eighth place. So I was like, yeah, it's still a overall in her season. She's still having a great season. But I do think compared to her most recent competitions, this Brian Sohn performance was the, the one where you really look at it and you're kind of not, you're not as blown away by, by her performance. And then maybe it was just kind of a bump in the road. I think she still has a, very promising future as well. I think we're, we we can all agree we really like to watch her climb and and we're really excited to see where where she progresses too. But yeah, it's not the best performance in Brienne's song. I think possibly my expectations were raised as well. Like we talked about, this is an opportunity for a lot of young climbers and she's obviously one of those breakouts where you say, maybe this will be the day because everybody else is gone. So maybe the expectations were slightly unreasonable given now that we saw that it was, you know, a healthy field. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I think both arguments, both arguments can work for sure. Yeah, interesting. Um, now, we didn't really like plan for this. So I know we all we all came in with notes for everything else that we talked about. But because this is the last debrief before the Olympic Games, which we will do a debrief for um, every like pretty much everything has been said about the Olympic Games already. We're not going to do predictions. Do them on your own and prepare to lose because it's, it's just going to be a mess. Just whoever you like you know, just, just assume that they're going to win. It's fine, whatever. Um, but I wanted to talk about, you know, from your guys' perspective, a, a ton of your job is is uh, building context and trying to prepare for what possible storylines are going to be. Um, so I'd like to have us all just kind of put out what it is that we're, we're looking for, what it is we're hoping for to come out of the Olympics. And I'm going to leave that extremely vague. Um, so whether that's a storyline or whether that's a result, anything like that, what is it that... Um, that uh, you guys are um, hoping to see, I guess we'll keep it we'll keep it simple. And uh, I don't know, John, if you'd be willing to start with this. Just it was an, it was an idea that you uh, posed. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll give you two real quick here. The first one, just in terms of what I hope or what I think would be great. Um, speaking as a obviously a, a, mem- a member of the American climbing media, it would really be great if an Olympic performance from the Americans could. It would be great, and it would be such a nice compliment to how great they've been on the World Cup circuit this year so far. Um, it would just kind of, it would just align nicely with this how this season has gone. So it'd be great if the if the Americans or an American would shine and in in whatever way that yeah I think there, are, I think there are ways to shine in the Olympics beyond just winning the gold medal. Obviously, winning a gold medal is fantastic, and that's a would be a wonderful result. But we've, I mean, there are countless cherished Olympic moments that have nothing to do with a gold medal and in some cases don't have to do with medals at all. So, yeah, it'd just be great to have some sort of big American storyline moment in a, in a good way coming out of the Olympics. But in terms of beyond that, one of the most curious things, one of the things I'm most curious about is who we've already mentioned on this debrief is Cheon So. 
I'm really, really curious to see her. We have not seen her at all this season. We didn't see her last season. Of course, we didn't saw hardly anybody because of the pandemic. And she was so fantastic in 2019. It was like it was almost like we were teased with this this potential like next great star in 2019. And then all of a sudden we had to, you know, kind of uh, just wait for two years. I she's been training i i assume her her father owns a climbing gym so she presumably has been able to do some training during the the lockdown in south korea maybe more so than some other athletes around the world that didn't have access to a gym during the pandemic or didn't have home walls or the means to build a home wall or something like that so that must that might have benefited cheon having access to a gym continuing to train she is just in my mind Aside from the weather, the humidity, and aside from the route setting, Cheon is like the biggest intriguing question mark for me heading into him. Very curious. Yeah, I think for me, I agree with all what you've said, John, but I think I can't really help but be a bit predictable, maybe, and boring at the moment because I've just got COVID issues like up to my eyeballs. Like, I do have concerns that something or someone will be derailed somehow by covid like already the like almost all of the tennis players are dropping out because mm-hmm. they're test positive and i can't help but think that you know among 40 athletes and all the coaches and the delegations like if something happens and they drop out and it's going to be absolutely heartbreaking for them um i actually just saw some new rules that were released today on the on the chances that you know events get cut short because athletes drop out um it doesn't sound like sport climbing will be affected that much it just says fewer athletes will compete in the final or in whatever so it doesn't seem like it would affect the actual you know running of the event overall but yeah there'll be some disappointment if that happens and you know changes in storylines and shocks and surprises i think but yeah, other than that, all being well, um, I'm really interested to see how Yanya copes with the pressure. You know, everyone's got such big expectations for her, but occasionally when things get quite important, she sometimes, you know, stumbles or gets a bit nervous. And it just, she's had so much interest and so much media attention that I can't imagine what it feels like to be Anya Garbenbrecht going into the Olympic Games just now. Also, the same goes for Adam Ondra. Um, I think he might have slightly less pressure to win from other people, like fewer expectations. But yeah, he's still got a huge lens placed on him at the Games, I think. Um, Other than that, Japanese on home turf, it'd be amazing to see how Akio goes on her last ever event. I hope she does really well. And yeah, I think just being there, or hopefully being there, um, it'll be really interesting to be behind the scenes and just see what they make of it all. Like, does Will it actually feel like an Olympics if there's no crowd? You know, it's a, a year later than they expected. About six or seven of them have got injuries and they won't be at their best. Like Essentially, the qualification has been a bit of a time warp back to 2019 because things have moved on. Like People like Brooke have advanced so much, whereas other people like Jesse and Shauna and like Miho now and and Adam, they've all picked up injuries. And how is that going to affect things? So there's just so many storylines and so many uncertainties. it's just going to be a case of see what happens, I think. I think it is really interesting how there there's kind of like a if you break it up and like if if athletes stock has gone up or down, there are very few athletes, I think, whose stock has actually provably gone up. I think Brooke is really the one standout for somebody who has blown away expectations this season. There are a lot of athletes whose stock has gone down, basically the ones you all just mentioned, whether it's due to injuries or just extremely uninspired performances. Um, Somebody like Alberto kind of fits into that list, right? 
Um, but then there's that huge set of climbers, including, you know, John mentions Cheyenne, but also the Chinese athletes on our end, both Canadian athletes, Sean and Alana are just cooped up in Vancouver in the Richmond Oval, just training away just amongst themselves. So it, this is kind of like, you know, you're, you're, you're buying stocks on the market and you see some have gone up and you see some have gone down. And then you've got a few businesses that haven't filed like year end earnings for like two years. <laughs> you're like, I don't, I don't, I have no idea what to expect from these guys. Right. And some, some countries are entirely quiet. Some countries are evidently lowering the bar on their athletes. And some athletes are doing that themselves. So you start hearing like, you know, Oh, I just, you know, I really hope, I get to enjoy the most of my experience, right? And then other countries are quietly talking about how, you know, we are absolutely crushing it, get ready to eat shit. Like, it's it's such an interesting dynamic going into this that's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Um, but the, the one thing I'm truly watching for, which is really basically what John said is, I've talked about how I want it to be an English-speaking athlete to to win, ideally, just because I think that can have the most cultural impact around the world. Um, on climbing, and particularly for for my neck of the woods, that would make it a lot easier for us to profit off of uh, off of climbing being in the Olympics. Is if we have a spokesperson that attracts a lot of attention. But John's entirely right, and you know any athlete in any sport can make a viral moment that forces the networks to run the clip over and over and over again. Right? Like it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be Yanya or or Adam or Tamora or whatever. It can be. Uh, Julia Shannardy, or it can be Aaron Sturkenberg, if that's if that's her name from from South Africa. If those people, whether it's you know the final lead climb of qualifiers where they are just screaming and and letting out their all and it's the most impressive show, or if it's somebody doing some unbelievable beta that goes into a near fall and they manage to catch it and and the camera angle just lines up perfectly right for it to just come across on the screen so well. I don't know what it is, but that's that's my ultimate wish at this point is for there to be some positive viral moment, not not an injury, fingers crossed, but a, a positive <laughs> viral moment that, you know, makes NBC and CBC play the clip every single night of you have to see what happened to this climber in speed climbing because or in, in sport climbing. Um, because, yeah, these these events are going to be on in the the worst hours of the night for you know john and i unless our athletes attract enough attention to get them aired in prime time the only other way to get on there is for for it to be so impressive that they're just forced to uh, to air it just due to public interest and it being such good tv so i'm praying that percy bishton and the crew gets that you know that special sauce just right i'm hoping the weather's perfect i'm hoping the climbers just fit the climbs perfectly i hope the cameras are in the right spot i know the olympics will do the production side perfectly um, so I'm just hoping it comes together where sport climbing is just unignorable. Yeah, same. I just hope it goes smoothly and the athletes look like they're having fun and they're not too affected by restrictions and the heat. I think the heat is going to be one of the main things for a lot of the Western athletes, I think. Um, yeah, I just hope people, it comes across well and that people see it as something that they might want to try and it's a positive thing for the sport ultimately that's all we can ask for yeah yeah i agree yeah it's it's interesting i'll i'll just say this it's interesting thinking about i i really like your point tyler about whether a competitor's stock has gone up or down over the past year or two i think i i think of course brooke we can all agree there i i would argue that i think most of team usa their stock has gone up either from their individual performance or just from team USA as a squad doing so well this, this season so far, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm wondering who are some other competitors that their stock has really gone up. Can you think of it? I maybe Laura Regora, right? Like she, Oh yeah. She, yeah. That's a great probably call. up. She's had a great season so far. Yeah. Um, other than her, I don't know if Yulia Kaplina was the world record holder for speed when she, when, when the Olympic qualification pathway began, I don't know if Aries had it then or Yiling had it, but um, obviously, you know, your stock's good if you're going into the Olympics with a, in a world record in the discipline that you're going to specialize in. I'm just curious if anybody else comes to mind for either one of you that stock has gone up, you know, over the last year or two. 
Not not instantly. Like again, I brought up Brooke because she was in my head the only one I could really think of. Laura is is was obviously an oversight. Yeah, you're absolutely right. She's looked excellent in lead climbing at least. Now how that goes in other disciplines, yeah, I'm unsure, but she's clearly shown that she is uh because you know, in Briançon last year, she was climbing against Yanya and she won and it was close. But these events, you know, have shown, even though she has weaknesses, that she she has uh, she is clearly a top tier climber. She's one of the stars right now. Um, but yeah, just kind of going through my heads, and I'm just trying to look through kind of the rankings right now, just seeing if there's anybody that I've forgotten. But again, like nobody, nobody's so memorable that it's really changing my uh, my opinions on what might happen at the Olympics. I guess that's that's the biggest thing, right? Like some people are steady, like Jakob Schubert. He's as good as he ever was. He's right about where I, you know, I don't think of him as up or down. He's Jakob Schubert. Same thing kind of with Adam Andra, save for that that little possible niggle that he was feeling that, you know, could end up causing a problem. But a lot of athletes is just like straight up or straight down or no info at all. So, yeah. Yeah. I guess you could say Colin Duffy. Um, yeah. I mean, I was... he had, didn't have any results in yeah. until this year and he's got... Yeah. Bronze, bronze medal. Yeah. Um, and I always had him down as a potential final maker. He's so good on lead, um, but hadn't really. His, his results are quite inconsistent in bouldering, but I think he's so relaxed and he's got not much pressure expectations really on him at all that he could do really well if he has a really good day on in Tokyo and just goes for it. He could be. A bit of an underdog, well, sure. An underdog sure. of sorts, because I think people do recognise that he's a real talent. Yeah. John, I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. I oh, think sorry. Akio. I, I agree with Colin. I think Akio is an interesting case as well, because on the one hand, performance-wise, I think you could say her stock has gone up a little bit after winning the Japan speed, the speed uh, portion of the Japan Cup. That's great improvement in the speed discipline. But on the other hand, she's, I think any competitor that's 28, 29, 30, you need to say that this extra year is, has not helped them, right? Because it's just, that's kind of how it goes with looking at the ages of the competitors and whatnot. So it's like, Akio's fascinating because on the one hand, I think she, her stock has gone up performance wise, but then you almost have to take it maybe back down caution, out of caution with the, the additional year for adding to her age. I don't know. Just I'll, I'll I don't, throw her name in. I, I might agree that her speed performance has gone up, but otherwise I feel like this has been a down year. Like, you know, missing out on a bunch of semifinals or missing out on a bunch of finals, pardon me. Um, no medals so far this season. Like this is, is shaping up to be one of the worst bouldering seasons of her life. Um, and I don't think she did any leads. She just, yeah, she did the lead at Innsbruck. Finished third. Sorry. Okay. I got a medal, got a medal in uh, third place in Innsbruck. But like as somebody that you would say her anchor is bouldering, um, it hasn't been particularly inspiring. So for me, I, I think she's trending down in my in my personal uh, calculation, I guess. But yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Do you guys have anything else you want to bring up before we wrap this thing up? Mm. Oh, it was interesting. In Briançon, there was the first climber from Mauritius competing so new climber from a new country seems of interest shows that the sport's kind of developing I guess I was I was torn about that point first of all because I feel bad attracting attention to an athlete who scored a three plus and a five plus in qualifiers um, which is just the case for countries where they don't have a lot of climbers coming out of it but it's also an interesting region that I know basically nothing about but Mauritius off the coast of Madagascar is a neighbor to Reunion, which is a French, which is, I don't think it's even a French terror. It's like part of France. It's just yeah, legit out. France. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And they've hosted a, a bunch of World Cups in the past, um, which I've noted, like the attendance has been terrible because it's often such like a weird place. And it was also kind of a generation ago that it hosted these events. But I think uh, from what I understand, Oriane Bertone was, was kind of born there. Or that's where she's from. Bunny. And Caroline it, yeah, Baldini. So they've got a really good. Yeah, pedigree. it is interesting how there is clearly some climbing culture there. I'm assuming they're mountainous countries just 
based mm-hmm. on that unless just for some reason a, a ship full of waltopia walls like shipwrecked off the coast and they just have this you know mecca of, of artificial climbing there so it is interesting and i i don't know how much cultural exchange there is between the two i know mauritius also has a lot of french speaking culture there so i assume there must be some um but yeah it's interesting um and it's, it is great to see somebody from another country show up on the circuit i just have been trying not to attract too much attention to it just because it's not like the kind of result you're going to scream home about but hopefully it's the start of something bigger i guess is is what we're all trying to say yeah yeah nothing else to add on i i guess a little shout out in the winners category to campbell harrison because he finished in 25th but they said on commentary that he was funding his entire world cup trip uh world cup circuit to europe out of pocket he's just paying for it himself i know that there are many other competitors that are likely doing that as well uh or at least some other competitors that are doing it as well but that's a long you know that's a long plane flight for him coming from australia and uh you know just it's really uh admirable that he's doing that and i certainly hope he gets funding from somewhere else uh soon because he's a good climber he deserves it I'll give a yeah. shout out to uh, Dmitry Fakirianov as well, just for the most entertaining climb of, uh, of finals. Go If you watch any climb, even if it's not the winners, go back and watch his because that was worth a laugh. And like, I feel like we haven't seen a lot of athletes like ask the crowd for extra support, right? When he did that, when he waved to the crowd, I was like, man, that doesn't feel that common this season, frankly, anymore. I don't know. It was kind of unusual. But He maybe. and Martin, he kind of smiled at the crowd and then Martin actually like waved uh, which was cool because I think they climbed right in a row. I think one after the other. So it was mm-hmm. neat that they both yeah. did Maybe that. that's an old school thing. Maybe the kids don't do that anymore. Maybe they don't feel like they're ready for that or it's like, what I don't know. Interesting. Anyway. It takes quite a lot of confidence because then if you fall off afterwards. <laughs> yeah, fair fair point. Fair point. You're really building things up. Yeah. Well, if, if that's the case, then uh, let's wrap this thing up. It's been a long half of the World Cup season, but it's uh, it's finally over now. We get to set up for the Olympics. Uh, shortly after that, we'll have a... Pardon me. Let me start that over again. The Olympics is coming up. After that, we'll have a few weeks off, and then we'll get back into the World Cup season and, of course, World Championships. Uh, so keep a, keep an eye out for content around all that. But for now, take a breather. Go develop another hobby or, you know, pay attention to the hobby or the loved ones that you've ignored for the for the last month during this World Cup uh, season. Uh, Natalie, thank you very much for making time out of your what sounds like a stressful, uh, stressful calendar as you mentally prepare for this trip. And John, as always, I appreciate you uh, uh, being flexible and and hopping in on this recording. So uh, thanks to both of you. And of course, thank you for watching the show. If you want to support the channel, you can check out our Patreon at the link in the description. If you want to talk with like minded people during competitions, make sure to join the Plastic Weekly Discord. Uh, And of course, like, subscribe, leave a comment if you feel like it uh, and all that. So thanks again. And we'll see you guys in the next one. If I find the stop button.